Welcome to another edition of Comic Detrimental. I am Dan Lush, joined by Mike Lawson and Jason Morin. What's up, guys? How much? How we doing? Love the Conlin hosted opening arguments that you guys just did. That was really excellent. I'm happy to be here for this podcast and let's do it. How's it going? I'm excited to see what opening arguments is going to lead into. You guys are just listening to our, our podcast and not checking us on social. We launched today the first of what will be a weekly video series, basically our own online show. Lawyers, as we know, have opening statements and they are told not to argue in your opening statements, but us sports lawyers, right? Us first take, pardon the interruption around the horn, guys, we know you have to argue. So the show is called Opening Arguments. Colin Farrell, broadcast journalism major. He was actually one of the, I'll call it producers on one of the radio shows I used to appear on. And then Colin uh, basically said, hey, can I help with you guys? And I'd love to help produce a show for you. And we said, Conlon, like, we can't really offer you that much. And he's like, well, you know what? I want to make my name in the sports industry. And I see the rocket ship that is kind of detrimental. And I want to jump aboard. So we said, Conlon, welcome to the team, my friend. So the end of this podcast feed, we're going to put the audio from Dan and I's debut episode on opening arguments, which will be an online show on Twitch and Twitter, YouTube, all the fun places. But before we get to that audio, we had some big topics to address. So I figured, Mike, Jason, you guys were, were two good ones to talk about some current events, really the sports law competition circuit, which you guys are both veterans of. And then we got to talk about the world events. We do not like talking about politics on this show, but sometimes our politics bloods into our sports. And if you don't know what's going on in the global world politics, you're going to miss some things in sports. So we're going to talk Russia, Ukraine. We're going to just talk high level. We're not going to get too deep into politics. Okay, let's get started. We had a series of articles or two articles that were posted last week on Conduct Detrimental. Really one and the other one's going to come up really by the time you guys are listening to us. The sports law competition circuit. You guys know I'm a veteran of it. I've competed in Tulane baseball. I competed in Thomas Jefferson. I coached a team to go to the Tulane baseball arbitration competition. Before we get into all the fun stuff that is the competition circuit, Mike, Jason, you guys are both competition veterans. Mike, let's start with you. Talk a little bit about your experience with sports law competitions. When I was a 3L at Syracuse, I went down to New Orleans and went to Tulane's basketball negotiation competition, competed in that. That was actually the week before the world shut down for the pandemic. So we, I was glad we were able to sneak that in. Really awesome opportunity to really see a lot of the judging and how Tulane operates. Uh, you know, I've seen a, a lot about it. So that was my first experience in, in uh, early 2020, as well as I, I did some internal ones within Syracuse. We actually started a, a internal sports law negotiation competition within Syracuse to grow our sports law team to, to send out to some of these competitions. So that's my experience. That's cool. You went to, you actually went to New Orleans. It's awesome. I didn't know you actually physically went to compete. My competition was last year, which was my 2L year. For those who don't know, I'm currently a 3L at Hofstra Law School in New York. So last year I competed in the Fordham Basketball Negotiation Competition, which was on Zoom. You know, I had spoke to the former president of Hofstra Cells, Tony Farina, who had competed in it and did very well and was prepped for it. But you don't really know what you're getting into until you really do it. For anyone, you know, on the fence about whether to do it or not, it's absolutely you should. It is so much fun. So for the Fordham competition, my first negotiation was a trade between the Charlotte Hornets, which was my client. You can call me the general manager, whatever you may. And the opposition was the Orlando Magic. So one thing I learned is that if you fleece the other side, it doesn't mean that you won the negotiation. I mean, we moved Gordon Hayward, $29 million salary. We brought in young pieces like Aaron Gordon, Mo Bamba, like two first round picks. So the trade was a fleece job. But at the end of the day, the judges are looking for negotiation strategy, framing the issues, you know, summing up where the negotiation stands and, and that type of thing. So at the end of the day, such a fun experience. Absolutely love it. But don't think you can go in there and just fleece someone and that's how you win. It's about negotiation strategy. So what you're hearing from both Jason and Mike, and I guess we should we should preface this with sports law competitions are maybe the coolest thing in law school. I will say it at least I thought it was the coolest thing. Jason, yes. Things are done in person outside of the pandemic world. I uh, once upon a time flew to New Orleans on Fordham Law School's dime and we competed. We had a lot of fun. The team that went the year before me, so in 2009, I think the NFC Conference Championship was there when I think it was the year the Saints won the Super Bowl. So that's what we preach to you guys on this podcast. Networking, show your show your skills. Like in Tulane baseball arbitration competition was the first, we'll call it sports mock trial. So if you need a reason to go to law school, you're on the fence. There is a budding competition circuit. So that was 10 years ago, it was just Tulane. Thomas Jefferson, a friend of the show who's been on a previous guest, Jeremy Evans, helped create Thomas Jefferson Sports Law Competition. And then as a 3 0, I created Fordham's Basketball Competition, Fordham's National Basketball Negotiation Competition. So fast forward, like nine years later, now Villanova, they have a number of competitions. Tulane doesn't just have baseball, 
Now they have football and they have basketball. And then the school that I'm now a professor at, at New York Law School, we have a soccer competition. There are other competitions around the country. So people should know about it. If you're listening to this podcast and you have not heard of these competitions, you're not doing something right. So you can reach out to us. We're happy to point you in the right direction. So we're going to try, you know, there, I don't really think there is an entity that kind of keeps track of these historical results, but we should. I think that's our duty to the sports industry at large. This past weekend, the Villanova Pro Football Negotiation Competition was won by a team from Texas A&M and Michigan Law School. And the orders, we know two of them, friends of the show, Skylar Corbin, president at Tulane Sports Law, won best order. Dave Goslaw, who I do not know, Maryland Law School, congrats to Dave. And Daniel Salib from Texas A&M Law, who I do know, who maybe not coincidentally, also won last year's Villanova Sports Law Football Competition. So listen, we're all about a show about explaining, you know, uh, explaining the, the landscape that is sports law. I think this weekend, or this upcoming week, Tulane's going to have their basketball competition on March 4th. And then the following week, Fordham, the competition I created March 11th, they're going to have their competition. So listen, the world of sports law competitions is booming. So we want everybody to know about it. I just got to add real quick, shout out Dave Ghostlaw. That's got to be the coldest name in the sports law competition circuit right now. I mean, that's like Ghost of Kiev levels. Ghost Law. That's pretty sweet. We have these sports law spotlights that we do it. And mainly these are done by two college students that write for us. It's Brendan Bell and Hunter Seidler. So Brendan Bell is a junior at Auburn and Hunter Seidler is a senior at Waybosh College. So both of them are going to matriculate to law school in the next year or two. But they reached out to us. We empower everyone. And they both were kind of asking me questions. Which sports law society is the best? Which school should I go to? And both of them independently were doing a lot of research on sports law societies. And I said, you know what? You know, it'd be great doing all these different articles for our website. What if you guys did like a sports law like society preview? So law, like college kids could actually have an educated decision of which school to go to. Like if anybody asked me for the last, I don't know, five years, I would tell them, and I'm happy to say this, people can yell at me, but I think the preeminent sports law societies in the country have historically been some combination of Tulane, Marquette, Arizona State, and Villanova, and some combination. Someone can yell at me, and UNH. I think I would throw all those five in there and then could be, you know, nitpick the rest of the top 10, but those five have to be in the top 10. But then there was, you know, these other sports societies that have a lot to offer, like Ole Miss, Georgia, and people started reaching out. They said, hey, can you profile our school, you know, in Sports Law Spotlight? So what happened, we just had something kind of organic happen, and Jason's laughing because you guys know what I'm getting to. We, we, uh, I got a note from my alma mater, Fordham Law School, that they had won three of the last four Tulane baseball arbitration competitions, which is huge. Tulane, it's the first baseball competition that's run by a friend of the show, Gabe Feldman. First competition of its type in the country, and that Fordham Law School had won three of the last four. I've never heard of anybody winning two in a row, let alone three of the last four. So I reached out to you know the current administrator administration of Fordham, and I said, "Can I speak to the students that are you know that one that are in charge of sports law society?" You know, they, I got in touch with them. I spoke to two current students, Sydney and Tori. I think one uh, L and two L, and they basically explained how they were winning. And it was so funny. Jason, Jason's laughing because you know what I'm going to get to. Fordham basically has you know, and I, I was there. There's really no faculty that help run the Sports Law Society. So basically, the three L's are the presidents and co-presidents, whatever, or editor-in-chief. And then the two L's coach the competition, and the one L's compete. So imagine being able to go to a school as a one L and being able to compete. If you were deciding between two schools, Fordham, which allows one L's to compete, and other schools, I'm going to leave a blank here, um, that don't allow one L's to compete, and you're on the fence between these two schools, like, I don't know, I'd love to compete in three years worth of sports law competition. So I think schools need to be on notice. Like you can't just ban one L's from competitions. One L's are just as smart as two L's. The fact that they haven't had dispute resolution training or moot court training. Fordham is winning the competitions with one L. So if you're not allowing one L's to compete, I don't usually make such hot takes on this, but like, I think you're doing it wrong. And I think these schools need to start reassessing. If you have a one L that wins your interest school competition, so be it. So anyway, the story goes, Jason, I'll, I'll kick it to you. But like Fordham... I acknowledge that they're the first dynasty in sports. People will yell at me, but Jason, uh, let me let me kick it to you, Jason. What do you, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, this is definitely a sore subject for me because the subtle shot you're kind of sending here is at my school. That's I am. Hopster I am. It's very. It's not very subtle. It's very explicit. <laughs> and I'm a huge hopster guy. I'm you know I'm definitely biased. I love my school. It's it's a great school, and Sports Law Society here is excellent. I'm the president of it, and we have a really great program here. However. Like you said, with the competitions, it's all run through our dispute resolution society. That's DRS. So as the president of cells, I don't have the jurisdiction, you could say, to really control who's competing and when they are. So with that, DRS has imposed a rule that you must 
compete in the internal competitions first, which is Hofstra students versus Hofstra students. And the students who do the best or are impressive, at least to the adjunct professor or, you know, the people in charge of DRS, those are the ones who are then afforded the opportunity to compete externally. And that process takes the 1L year. So that's why Hofstra doesn't have any 1L students competing in external competitions. However, I think it's a completely flawed system. You know, I actually went rogue my 1L year off the map, signed up myself, and maybe ruffled some feathers here at at school. I'm I'm not going to get into detail about that. But, you know, with that said, Fordham had 1Ls who won the competition. So we have a rule where 1Ls need to prove themselves. They waited for you the last four years. They got to be doing something, right? Exactly. And, and then you got to throw in the, the fact that they're not considering is that our internal competitions are rarely about sports. So if you have a one L who is a sports fanatic, who knows maybe analytics or knows really in-depth contract details, why should he have to compete internally about, you know, a criminal plea deal to prove himself as, as a worthy negotiator when he could be a sports fanatic who's learning about the law and that could be sufficient. It is sufficient. You look at Fordham, you look at Villanova. So, you know, I want to see change here at Hofstra. Maybe when I graduate, I'll just become the DRS adjunct professor. I mean, down the line, that could be. Not, if, not after that take that you just made. They'll, they'll probably ban you from the school. Mike, well, <laughs> what, what was the setup over at Syracuse? Yeah, it, it's actually the same uh, to what Jason just said. So we have an advocacy honor society is what it's called at Syracuse. So uh, basically all of the competitions are run under that external and internal, right? So we have numerous internal competitions within Syracuse and same thing, your 1L year, you are, you can compete in a number of different competitions, whether it's, you know, appellate, oral arguments or negotiation or how the setup is. So you can either win at a competition or get to a certain level in one of those internal competitions to be admitted into the Advocacy Honor Society, or you can try out for it and get on that way, uh, which takes, like like Jason said, it, it could take up your whole 1L year. And then once you are in the Advocacy Honor Society, you then have to try out separately for whatever type of competition team that you want to do. So sports law is within that. So then you have to have a separate tryout to be placed on the sports law team. That's and then even they'll, more they'll convoluted have, than Hofstra. Yeah, it's it's pretty in depth, which is why I actually didn't get onto the sports law team until my three L year. It actually took me two years just to get onto the sports law team. Granted, when I first started at Syracuse, the process was changing, so I kind of lost my one L year because I didn't do the internal competition. So if I had done that initially, then I would have been a step ahead. So I lost that one year because I didn't do any internal competitions. So that rule didn't really start until my two L year. So I kind of lost that because I didn't realize it. But at the same time, we were also like. Jason, you said that you didn't have any sport related topics for your internal ones. We were also as a part of, you know, I became president of our entertainment sports law society. We call the ESLS at Syracuse. We created entertainment sports law negotiation competition. So that went forward my two year, which I actually competed in, which was actually the reason that I was able to get onto it. advocacy on our society was because I, I made it to the semis in our internal one, which I have beef with that of why I didn't get to the finals, but I, that's for another day. But it is a process. And, and I think that's the same for a lot of schools, you know, because schools don't want to send just anybody to some competitions as you're representing that school. So they want to make sure that you are polished and ready to go compete to represent that school, which I understand. But I, I understand sometimes a process needs to be done. And sometimes it's more difficult than it has to be. My only problem with that, Mike, well, let me ask you this. It's not a true question. How many Tulane baseball arbitration competitions have Hofstra or Syracuse won ever? I'm going to say none. I don't okay. know off the top of my head. Okay. So if, if just let's assume for purpose of this, that Tulane baseball, we'll say is the gold center or, or somewhere close to it. Like if you're not winning them, right, there's something that's happening that's wrong. So the students are so intimately involved at Fordham, they're, they're coaching, whatever. And I'm not, this isn't a plug for Fordham, but I'm just saying this is a plug that one else should be more involved. So Mike, I'm totally get If you're planning to send a team to a competition, right, that should be the best team that you can possibly assemble. But now we've just talked about, we mentioned about like 10 of them. New England has a, a hockey competition this summer. There's a competition popping up all across the place. I would hope a school would have the foresight to just say, you know what, let's hit as many of these competitions as possible. We don't need to have an intra school on top of an intra school on top of an intra school to figure out that we should, which 3L we should send. If you have 1Ls that are interested in competing, you should be filling those spots. So it should be a no brainer. But typically, so, the requirement for a lot of these law schools is you have to have a coach per team. So some don't, just don't all, have the resources. We created the New York Law School soccer competition to really fight against that. You don't need a coach. What what faculty member is going to know more about sports than a 22, 23, 24-year-old? Don't necessarily need a coach. And honestly, right, 
if you don't win, it's, there's no, no harm, right? The, the schools that won this competition for New York Law School was Marquette. Marquette's one of the most polished schools in the country. But all these other schools got to compete, they got to network. But anyway, but I digress. The main reason I wanted to bring this up, I, I pointed out, right, just a kind of a subtle shot at these 1L schools or non-1L schools, but Fordham won three of the last four years. So I made the observation and I spoke to the students. I said, is, is that the first time that's ever happened that a school has won three of the last four competitions at Tulane? And the students at Fordham said, yeah, I guess so. I would have known, I'm sure. So I made a mistake or mistake, we'll say a happy accident. And I said, first dynasty ever in sports law competition history. So I posted that across social, LinkedIn, Instagram, Twitter. No one said anything on Twitter. Everyone's like, yeah, Fordham's the greatest. LinkedIn, no one said anything. Fordham's the greatest. Go Rams, hashtag go Rams. Instagram, I got blown up. 60 DMs like immediately from Villanova. We dispute this, it's not true. The football competition, Tulane football, has been won by Villanova, I've learned in hindsight, four out of the last seven years. So, yeah, there was a dynasty before Fordham. Um, they won the football competition, Villanova did. So, yeah, shout out to Tulane, shout out to Fordham, shout out to Villanova, shout out to Brendan Bell, who wrote the Fordham article, and shout out to Hunter Seidler, who kind of skewered me with an article calling me out for messing up this dynasty stuff. So that'll be out on kind of detrimental. Shout out to Villanova. So yeah, that's it. You know, we, we do call ourselves uh, the intersection of sports and law. We got to help our law students out. We got to help our college students out. The sports competition circuit is thriving. Maybe at some point, kind of detrimental will have its own, but. You just conceded that easily. You're walking it back now. You're, you're saying that your Fordham dynasty call out was a mistake. I mean, defend well, your honor, defend your alma mater here. Come on. Well, I said it was the first. Okay. okay. So like it okay. wasn't the first, but I will say in terms of what is better, Tulane winning three of the last four years in baseball, baseball is the gold standard of all competitions versus football, no, no. which is a relatively new competition. I think you can make the argument, but in the interest of uh, being uh, political here, I'd say the tie goes to whoever wins the basketball competition. So we'll see. We've got a Tulane basketball competition popping up soon. Let's see who wins that. How um, did Fordham sign up for that? It's a good question. Unclear, but I know Villanova did. But let's see, Villanova's got to win first. Dan, I think any advice I can give to um, current law students who are interested in sports law or entertainment or sports law is one to write. I mean, we've kind of set that up with Conduct Detrimental, where if you wanted to enhance your portfolio of writing, we have access for you where you can just submit your blogs and articles and there's no limitations really. Jason is amazing. You know, he reviews them all and edits them, make sure that they're polished and ready to go and publish them. But the other aspect is competitions. I think you really get to polish your negotiation skills and your networking skills when you go to these competitions. I know it's tough right now with the pandemic and a lot of them are virtual, but actually physically going there is such an amazing experience. So those are the two really that I would suggest is writing in these sports law competitions. But Dan, you said, you know, probably the most fun that you could have as a law student, if you're interested in sports law is going to these competitions. On top of that, I do agree with that. But I also would say that another awesome opportunity is to go to UVA softball tournament where you can compete against other law schools in a softball competition, which is so fun. You reference New England, Western New England, which is in Massachusetts. They have a basketball competition where you can go and play basketball against other law schools. So there are some fun things that you can do that's relative to sports, obviously away from the law aspect. And it's you're competing against law schools and softball and basketball, but that's fun. But as a part of that too, with UVA, we were told by our amazing sponsors, Themis, that Themis sponsors the UVA softball tournament. And Themis is also a sponsor of our podcast. Themis and Conduct Detrimental have been teamed up for the last few months. I think we're closing in on a year here. So probably seven months we're at now. And Themis Bar, they're a bar prep company. You can access a lot of materials as a 1L, 2L, 3L for your finals and for your midterms. But for their bar prep, if you want any more information, head over to themisbar.com forward slash con detrimental. And you can see some more information about how to sign up for their bar prep, as well as they still have the exclusive $200 discount if you sign up using that code themisbar.com forward slash con detrimental. Okay, so that'll take us to our, our second topic of the day, and then we'll get over to uh, opening arguments. So we were debating if we want to talk about Russia-Ukraine battle, and it's not that it's not important, just we're sports law podcast, and I think most people come to us for a break. But at this point, the linkage between sports and politics is unmistakable. You know, unless you're living under a rock, you know what's going on with Russia and Ukraine. What we want to do here for our, our sports fans' perspective is just talk about what's kind of happening, how the effects of what's going on between these two countries are impacting our sports. So, Mike, I'll, I'll turn it over to you. What's the latest with um, the IOC and the Olympics? 
the IOC is stepping in again, you know, not talking politics here, but it does cross over into the law realm, the, you know, the sports realm here. We obviously just saw the Winter Olympics did end, um, but the International Olympic Committee has banned Russia and Belarus from all international competitions. They are citing the Olympic truce that they have, which basically says to protect the integrity of global sports competitions and for the safety of all participants. So citing to that, they're saying they don't want any international competitions with Russia or or Belarus due to the military invasion of Ukraine and the ongoing situation there. So on top of that, they're also urging FIFA and UEFA to also ban Russia from all international football competitions. They are also, again, citing to that Olympic truce that they have and to protect the integrity of the sport and the uh, safety of all athletes. I guess let's go around the sports landscape. There's a couple notifications, I guess, that I've been getting. Number one, uh, you guys know I follow you know, Formula One pretty closely. They were supposed to have a Grand Prix event in Russia. The Formula One governing body took that out. At least when it comes to soccer, you know, Chelsea's owner, I guess, had ties to, uh, to Russia. He is, uh, I guess, stepping down or giving the team to, to someone else to manage in the middle of all this, a guy by the name of Roman Abramovich. And then there's now talks that I guess he's been involved in the Russian-Ukraine peace talks. So he's trying to do some damage control. And then, you know, the other one I saw that I thought was worth mentioning, U.S. soccer is refusing to compete against Russia amid the invasion of Ukraine. So, you know, if you didn't understand what was going on with Russia and Ukraine, you might be wondering, right? There's even a conversation, which I was telling you guys about in Formula One. There's at least one Russian driver, which we might not be able to compete because there's this kind of global backlash against Russia, right or wrong. It's not our place to say who's right, who's wrong. Obviously, we, we have our viewpoints on this, but we, we decided to spare them from the podcast. So don't read into who we are for or against. We'll let the political pundits talk about war strategies and, and all that other nonsense. Jason, anything to add on this one before we, we move on? Yeah, I would just say that, you know, I think sports governance organizations have a responsibility and a role to play in all of this. You know, obviously, we want them to stay bipartisan when they can. But when there's something that's so just striking on a global stage, they need to act. And, and that's what we're seeing. And these are difficult decisions to make. And, and, you know, some of these Russian athletes you have to feel for who come from a place of complete innocence and are being put on the spot because of maybe some actions from their country. Quick shout out to Justin Mader, a new conduct detrimental contributing writer. He's got two great articles on the Formula One stuff. The first was American owned F1 team Haas basically removed their sponsor, which is a Russian company, Girl Kali, if I'm pronouncing that correctly. And another one was another Russian sponsor, Russ Gonke, which is looking like a force majeure argument with uh, F1 trying to remove them as a sponsor and, and the company saying that uh, it would be a breach to do so and rather the agreement should be suspended. So interesting stuff there, Dan. Yeah, I mean, just to add that, I, I referenced it, but I'm happy, I'm happy you brought up the articles. So Haas has a driver, Nikita Mazepin, who's, who's Russian, right? So the Ukraine Motorsport Commissioner, I guess they call it the Motorsport Federation of Ukraine, has asked Formula One to ban all Russian drivers. So like, Listen, we're we're not a political podcast, and I'm sure Formula One, right? They don't want to be political. Internet, you know, the the IOC, they don't want to be political. But you're you're kind of forced along these lines. Sometimes these conversations are inevitable and unavoidable. So, listen, all our job here is to report on it. Again, certainly not going to see the last of this. We're going to continue to see fallout across sports. I think for for the most part, by and large, I think there's two there are two Ukrainian uh, NBA players. I know Alex Len was one of them, former top ten pick from uh, Maryland back in the day. But yeah, I mean, just with our domestic sports, obviously NHL is going to have the most probably impact dealing with those type of issues. But Major League Baseball, the NBA, NFL, by and large, is not really much Russian or Ukraine elements. I'm sure there are some players, but we'll keep an eye on it. We'll obviously keep monitoring it closely. Okay, so this will take us to, uh, you know, maybe the bulk of this episode. We'll keep this pretty tight. Conlon Farrell, we gave him a shout out at the top. He uh, used to be on a radio show that he used to be on. He basically said, like, well, you guys should move to video. You guys are, you guys are both have what we say faces for radio, but like maybe your presentation on, on video will overcome. I'm just, I'm half kidding. Dan, Dan, and, uh, Dan and my wife, you know, joke that why are we on radio? We're such good looking guys, right? Like, no, I'm just I'm t- totally messing. But yeah, so we decided to f- uh, foray into video for the first time. And it's not going to be a show with Dan and I. It's going to be a show. Mike, Jason, you'll be on if you're a listener of Conduct Detrimental and you have contributed in some way to what we do, be it an article or, or something else. We're finding ways to get on. So I've spoken to a few of you. If you are interested in being a part of this video series, being part of a debate series, uh, I've spoken to a couple admins at law schools across the country about this concept. We want to make this all inclusive. And maybe it's the same platform if you guys are listening to us about how hard it is to compete in competitions, how hard it is to get public speaking experiences. 
we're going to get you right in right in the space. So that's uh, eventually what we want to do and open this thing up to, to everyone. So yeah, a uh, 15 minute show, you know, it'll be very familiar format, best of three series. You're going to hear Colin talk about the rules, but we wanted to put the audio here. We're not going to do that each and every week, but we are going to have an episode of, uh, of the show, Opening Arguments. Once a week, every Monday, it'll drop, but we wanted to at least introduce you guys to it. It's Dan and I going tit for tat on Brian Flores, Deshaun Watson, and Dan Snyder. Without further ado, let us kick it over to the raw, unedited audio of opening arguments, and then we will come back to do a new What to Watch For. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the first episode here, opening arguments presented by Conduct Detrimental. I'll be your host, Conlon Farrell. And today I got Pocket Aces, The Dance, the co-host of the podcast, Conduct Detrimental, the number one sports law podcast out there. Joining me now, Dan Wallach and Mr. Dan Lust. Gentlemen, how are we? We're doing great, Conlon. Uh, you, you did an amazing job with the studio over here. This is, I didn't listen. I, I tell you what, a lot of people doubt me because I'm wearing the white Sanchez jersey, Mark Sanchez, a little tribute to my Jets. But hey, got things done right, um, and we're we're excited. I'm very excited to have both you guys on here. We're gonna have a debate style show. Each of you is gonna be a given a topic. You're also both gonna have a minute to make opening statements. After that, we'll have rebuttal, reply, and then hey, listen, I'm the one with the squeaky gavel, so I'll be the one awarding a point to one of you, gentlemen. Oh, and yeah. then we'll we'll go from there. But I'm really yeah. excited. The first of its kind, our video show here, engaging our uh, viewers. So let's get it rolling, boys. Uh, I think we need to start here and with the NFL. Deshaun Watson, right? Deshaun Watson is a hot topic around the league. He has yet to put on a different uniform. He's yet to be moved from Houston. Um, as you can see here, we think – what are we thinking? Do we think Deshaun Watson – ends up in another uniform next year, and how many games does he play? Dan Lust, I'm going to toss it to you first. Where are we going? Does Deshaun Watson end up somewhere else next season? So uh, I've been pretty clear on this one. Um, if I'm a general manager of an NFL team, I'm not touching the guy, right? Somebody else can make a trade for him at this point. I, I don't really think the uh, the juice is worth the squeeze, so to speak. So, I mean, you ask me, um, I'm not sure Deshaun Watson is going to be playing uh, in the upcoming season. So if you put that over at six and a half, I mean, Colin, you maybe could have put it at a half. Uh, <laughs> and still be inclined to take the under. The guy didn't play all of last year. And keep in mind, a suspension has not yet happened. So go back maybe, uh, you know, five, ten years at this point. Ben Roethlisberger had these own charges. No no criminal charges resulted, but he was suspended for ten games. So you know, yeah. I, don't, I don't think we're going to get clarity on this. I think April 1st is the date we're looking at potential criminal charges. But, you guys, the suspension could be looming as well. So – um, you know, at the end of the day, I'm going to go under here. I don't know if he's going to get traded, not traded, but I feel pretty confident uh, in the under in this one. I'm, I'm slamming it. If, if I'm at a, at a sports book, I'll take the under. <laughs> All right. That minute is up now. Dan Wallach, you, sir, the bet is to oh, you. Thanks, Colin. Well, I, I go back to the expression, fortune favors the bold. Have you taken a look at the rosters around the National Football League and who's playing the quarterback position? At best, there may be eight to 10, what I would consider franchise type quarterbacks in the National Football League. There are teams like the Carolina Panthers rolling out uh, quarterbacks like Sam Darnold. Uh, I mean, it goes just go up and down the league. There's mediocrity throughout the NFL. And the NFL may have 32 teams, but only eight are legitimately in the Super Bowl hunt. If he can avoid the criminal charges, I think there's a, a high likelihood that he's going to be playing in the 2022 regular season. And I don't see how a suspension, if it's just based on the civil allegations, can be any greater than six to eight games. And I think it's worth a shot. Uh, you got to go for the glory here. I mean, NFL uh, executive positions turn over too constantly. This is the chance to just go for it. And he's worth it. A top five quarterback. Dan Lust, to you. This is a pretty easy one. Dan, I'm not questioning Deshaun Watson's talent. Certainly fortune favors the bold, but at a certain point, if the guy's not going to be playing, right, uh, and he just went through the whole last season, there was no no criminal charges. He didn't play. There was no suspension, no nothing. So I just don't think the, the risk is worth it, and I can't imagine 
hey, Deshaun Watson's going to be back week 10. Let's get him ready to go, right? I, I just don't I just don't see that happening. I don't know what team takes a chance in it that hasn't taken one already. Carolina was supposed to make a deal. Denver, Tampa, all these teams need quarterbacks. But I, if I'm the general manager of that team and I trade for Deshaun Watson and the guy gets sent to prison, right, we're all talking about these criminal charges. Uh, I, I mean, that's terrible on my resume. So I'm not ready to take that risk. I'm not going to. All do right. That. All right. And Dan Wallach, your final counter. Well, I mean, let's take a look at the the, the reality uh, of what the world will look like if he's not charged criminally. Then it becomes, do the civil allegations rise to the level of a suspensable offense? The NFL will do its investigation. But bear in mind here, he's already served a full season on the sidelines. He's been inactive, uh, levied basically a de facto suspension for 17 weeks. And I think the NFL needs to take that into account. Because under the NFL's collective bargaining agreement, there is a restriction on double penalties. If he's already been penalized by the Houston Texans uh, and the NFL tries to levy uh, another lengthy suspension on top of that, I think you're going to see arbitration over this issue and potentially resort to the courts. Uh, civil allegations, he's going to be able to come back from that. And I would take the risk if I'm an NFL general manager, once the criminal is out of the way, that's a, that, that's a statement. That wait, I am wait, waving wait, my point. Seconds I am waving no criminal, my rubber hammer. Wait, 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 wait. Uh, if there's no criminal, oh, there's 30 what? seconds. I gotta be, I gotta be hard. Zen, I hit the buzzer. Right. Don't you I'm, watch I'm, the presidential I'm, debates? Yeah, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> exactly. And those lasted forever. Jeez. Yeah. And so that's where I'm gonna. I have to cut you off. I'm waving the squeaky hammer, and a decision has been rendered. But Mr. Wallach, you'll like the outcome. I award the point to you. I don't think there's a way that Deshaun Watson doesn't start week one for another NFL franchise. No, it won't be in Houston, but I do find a way that the deal does get done. I really think that uh, Carolina might be his landing spot. Obviously, Miami was uh, suitors. They were in the running last year. We thought a deal might get done. It did not, but I do think Deshaun Watson steps on the field week one next year. That'll be my bold prediction. Okay. Now we move forward. Obviously, we're going to stay in the NFL on our all gridiron episode one of opening arguments. Another bombshell that happened right uh, as February began this month. Brian Flores, the former Dolphins head coach, levying a lawsuit against the league and several of its teams. Um, he's now been hired, though, in Pittsburgh. He is hired as a senior defensive assistant and linebackers coach. Guys, Brian Flores, obviously, his tenure in Miami wasn't stellar. But it certainly didn't look to me as um, deserving to be fired. And that's kind of where he went with his lawsuit. Does Brian Flores coach again the over under number of years until he's a head coach again is two and a half? Who's taking that over? Mr. Wallach, you hold serve here. So I'm going to go to you over under two and a half years until Dan, oh, excuse me, until Brian Flores rather is a head coach in the NFL again. Uh, in my view, it's definitely going to be under. And just look at the state of affairs pre-filing of the lawsuit and post-filing of the lawsuit. On January 31st, the NFL had one black head coach. Mm -hmm. Within two weeks after Brian Flores filing his lawsuit, uh, three black head coaches, you know, yeah. Houston and Miami. And what's going to be very important is that there are going to be incentives uh, but besides, besides, Brian Flores is a top level coach. He's going to prove himself in Pittsburgh. He's going to do a very good job under Mike Tomlin. But again, I expect there at some point to be a global settlement in his litigation under which there are going to be draft pick incentives attached to the hiring of black coaches. He's you have to remember, he's a damn good head coach. His record speaks for itself. And the, there eventually will be a global settlement and some compromise where teams are going to be incentivized to mm -hmm. hire black head coaches in the form of draft picks. And, and, and you have to remember, he set historic precedent, and he's going to be so incredibly popular among players, free agent recruiting, <laughs> definitely the under. All right, the under by Mr. Wallach. Dan Lust, your counter. Um, so I guess, uh, you know, first and foremost, Brian Flores is a fantastic head coach. I don't think anyone is questioning that. The question is whether suing the NFL gives you a right, uh, gives you the ability to play in the NFL or coach in the NFL. You know, uh, 10 and 6, 9 and 8, Flores has a winning record this last two seasons as a head coach. But the question is whether a team is going to take a chance on him to be their head coach. So I, I certainly think Flores has a future in the NFL. He's back on the Steelers staff already. I don't think necessarily anybody expected him to be back in the NFL, uh, you know, this quickly. Um, maybe some did. But, um, you know, when you sue all 32 NFL teams, uh, I think you take the risk that maybe you're not going to get the helm again. 
Uh, so Mike, to- Mike Tomlin put him on his staff, maybe the most uh, overqualified linebackers coach in the history of the NFL. I think that senior defensive assistant label is usually one given to a head coach in waiting. I just don't think, right, the, the life of this lawsuit, we know litigation really well. This class action lawsuit, racial discrimination, could go on for two and a half, three years. So I think that line is right. I'm going to take the over, though. All right, Dan Wallach, 30 seconds. Sure. One of the tried and true litigation tactics among class action defense counsel is the strategy known as picking off a class representative. If Brian Flores is hired as a head coach by an NFL team, he can no longer serve as an ad. His lawsuit goes away pretty much, and he cannot be a class representative if he's a current NFL head coach. It happens time and time again in class action litigation to go after the head coach or go after the class representative. And as a qualified head coaching candidate, there is a lot of upside in hiring them. And then you get the uh, fringe benefit of being able to neutralize the litigation by picking off the class rep. And this has happened before, you know, with with Michael Sam and the NFL teams stepping up and doing a league of favor. I'm blowing the whistle. Wallach Wallach doesn't believe in the neon numbers. He sees right through them. I give him credit. I give him credit for the confidence. Dan Lust, you have 30 seconds. Make your final point. You can give him 35. Give him 30. I'll spot him five. Just let's start the clock here. All if right. Dan doesn't get deducted for going over again, I, I, this point has to be mine. But but neither here nor there. I've used my five seconds appropriately. Um, so, I mean, at the, at the end of the day, right, Brian Flores filed this lawsuit knowing, and he said, I might never be, a, I might never coach again in the NFL, but this lawsuit is more important, um, you know, than, than maybe m- myself, right, as an NFL head coach. So I think he bides his time. I think he comes back. Dan, your, your point is well made that, you know, change is already happening. But, you know, Lovey Smith is the head coach of the Houston Texans, not Brian Flores, right? So maybe there's a tax to filing that lawsuit that you have to now go back to the end of the line. Not that I agree with it, but Colin Kaepernick, again, never returned to the NFL after that lawsuit. Kurt Flood never played again. So, um, you All know, right. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go with uh, my gut here. We're going to rest your cases. All right. And I will give Mr. Lust after the Wallach time lapse. We're going to give the point here to Dan Lust. I agree. <laughs> Um, as we've seen in these multiple lawsuits that have come out, uh, litigation the NFL's had to deal with, at the end of the day, the NFL owners obviously are not going to take too kindly to being sued, obviously, by one of their uh, former head coaches. I still think he is a excellent and well-deserving candidate to be a head coach somewhere. I just think he's going to kind of have to pay his dues now once again. So I think it'll be a little bit while before Brian Flores. I don't think he won't become another one, but I think it'll be a few years before he takes the helm um, in a new NFL city. So with that being said, we go to the rubber match. Our final topic on this first episode of Opening Arguments brought to you by Conduct Detrimental, the leader in sports law coverage. All right, Dan Snyder and the Washington Commanders. Will the NFL forcibly remove Dan Snyder as an owner? We have the line set here at minus 500. It's never been done before. Dan lost to you, sir. Okay. Um, I'm going to say, I mean, listen, I, I'm all for, uh, you know, trying to push Snyder out if he does bad stuff, right? Sexual assault allegations, sexual harassment allegations, toxic workplace, right? At a certain point, I made the joke on the podcast, but it's sports low bingo. Dan Snyder and, and his Washington NFL team, Redskins, Commanders, whatever you want to call it, they've done everything wrong, right? And they've even uh, maybe sullied the name of Sean Taylor, uh, to try to get some good PR uh, in the middle of this firestorm. Um, I, I think if anyone is deserving to lose their team, it's Dan Snyder just from a decade's worth of, of uh, misconduct, especially mm-hmm. sexual assault, sexual harassment allegations. But he asked me what I think is going to happen. Um, Roger Goodell and the NFL owners sweep this under the rug constantly. And it's no stranger with Dan Snyder. They, they pretended to do an independent investigation, actually hired a lawyer to defend them for a preemptive litigation claim. So minus 500 is a lot. I don't think it's going to happen. I want it to. I just, I don't think it's going to happen, guys. I just, uh, you know, you ask me, I'm a betting man. I just, I don't see it happening. Dan Wallach, your thoughts. Well, I believe the walls are closing in on Daniel Snyder. The NFL's attempt to cover up his misdeeds uh, has met an immovable force. And that immovable force is Congress, which has this broad investigative and subpoena power. The truth will eventually come out. The report will eventually come out, and Congress has a lot of weapons at its disposal to force the NFL to talk and to force these admissions and and the, and, and the Wilkinson report to be aired out and to receive a public disclosure. And once that's out, it's going to be curtains for Dan Snyder and, the, and, and Congress's weapons here. 
And they're already starting to hint at repealing the uh, exemption, antitrust exemption for the Sports Broadcasting Act, maybe uh, repealing uh, laws on tax breaks. Uh, Snyder's eventually going to become collateral damage because of it, because Congress can bring in the, the Dallas Cowboys cheerleader lawsuit within the scope of its, if its investigation. He's disposable baggage. He's going to be gone in two years. All righty. Dan Lust, your next point. So uh, I, I think, Mr. Wallach, you missed the call of the question. The question was, will the NFL for Stan Snyder to sell his team? That has never happened. That's unprecedented in the NFL, unprecedented in sports. Not even, you know, Donald Sterling. The, the NBA didn't force him to sell it, right? Even Mar Schott, she voluntarily sold it. You know, it's very possible that the walls come in, like with Jerry Richardson. And then Dan Snyder makes the decision on his own to sell. Because, right, Mr. Green Talks could be a $3 billion sale, $4 billion sale in a major media market like D.C., Will Dan Snyder be the first guy who's so pig-headed that the NFL forces him to sell? Possible, but unlikely. I, I, I just don't think the NFL is going to end up doing it. Dan okay. Wallach, close us I'll, out. I'll answer your question much more explicitly. The NFL will force Dan Snyder to sell because the bar is very low under the Constitution and bylaws of the league. If he's found to have committed conduct detrimental to the game of football, to the NFL and the game of football, awesome. all it's going to take – is a three quarters vote of the remaining owners to displace him as owner. And these sexual assault allegations, you know, making the unwanted sexual advances, the hand on a thigh, pushing uh, Tiffany Johnston towards the limo, that in and of itself is conduct detrimental to the NFL. And that will be his demise. All righty. And that rounds it out. I love the plugs thrown out by Mr. Watt. There are multiple conduct detrimental references, but a decision must be rendered, and I have to say, I side here with the favorite. I do not believe that the NFL will forcibly remove Dan Snyder. It hasn't been done before. Uh, while some great points made, though, especially with Congress now involved. But for this time being, I do not see Dan Snyder having to be removed by the league itself. Who knows? There's certainly more to come with that. I think um, the report that they didn't release the full findings of back in the summer was a sham. So who knows? Maybe they do find something that they're looking for that will finally oust him down there in Washington, D.C. But that'll wrap up episode one of Opening Arguments. Gentlemen, I thank you both for joining me. Um, something different, something new, I think, to give our audience a um, visual. I think it's really, really something that will help further engage our broadening, our ever-expanding niche in sports law. Um, guys, thanks so much. Any final thoughts? Oh, that's right. That's right. What are you talking about? We need some FaceTime for Mr. Lust. Go ahead. Uh, <laughs> Go on with your bad self. This is a shout out to you. Great, great form over here. Uh, Dan, I actually bought your argument. I, I'd probably take it at plus 500 and I'm rooting for it. Um, but at the end of the day, uh, you know, Con, this is a great form that you've set up over here. And, and uh, you know, we're lucky uh, that we're doing this. So I think once a week, Con, then we'll be back here. Uh, maybe, maybe Dan and I, maybe uh, some other duos of conduct detrimental but uh some lawyers and conlon you served as a fantastic ref maybe we'll even get you a real gavel instead of that dog squeak yeah, toy over there. yeah a little squeak toy exactly well guys it's been great it's been fun Wait, um sports law history in the making i think there's never been never a been a lot in, in, in the history this. of sports law commentary no one's ever done it this is going to take off great first episode conlon dan fantastic job uh, let, let's keep rolling with it. These are this is a strong first week, though. I hope we have topics like this from week to week. It doesn't get any better than Dan Snyder, yeah. uh, Brian <laughs> Flores, and Deshaun Watson. That's like the Hall of Fame exactly. of NFL legal controversies. Well, exactly. As long as people keep making bad decisions, we'll be here to talk about it. Um, guys, thanks again so much. And um, for everyone out there, thank you guys for tuning in. Opening Arguments, Episode 1 for Conduct Detrimental. I'm Conlon Farrell. So there you have it, the first ever opening arguments. And of course, I was going to win that. I mean, Wallach just completely abused the clock. We don't have the clock up for a reason. So maybe substantively, it was a tie, right? We're both named Dan. We're both making good arguments. But Dan, I mean, if we say you got a minute on the clock, 30 seconds of the clock, you can't go 10 seconds over and expect not to be deducted on points. Just the typical rules of the debate. But uh, yes, it was a lot of fun. So I hope, hope everyone enjoyed it. We'll be back next Monday. So as promised, we will kick it to what to watch for. Mike. Lead us off. 
So obviously, if you are a listener of the podcast, you've you've heard me on some of the episodes that we've had with Evan Drellick and you know Taryn's a big baseball guy as well. We're still in the lockout situation here. We're still waiting for these negotiations to come to something, come to some agreement. You see the reports every day, so we don't want to really go into specifics on some of the proposals because they, they might not even happen. I mean, they're, they're just so far apart and it's so it's disheartening to see the back and forth. I mean, they've gone seven straight days now with negotiating and going back and forth and it still says that they're kind of far apart. Some of the news that we've heard, but have, has now actually going to happen here is the Players Association authorized a stipend for each of their players, $5,000 a month. And as the negotiations continue to delay, that stipend will increase to $15,000 a month on April 1st. You know, as soon as future months might occur, that could go up as well. So it's basically a wait and see game here. We're definitely losing spring training games and it's looking like we could potentially lose the beginning of the season as well. So definitely keep an eye on The Athletic, follow Ken Rosenthal, Evan Drellick, Jeff Passan. They've got it all covered on the negotiations. We saw Garrett Cole was there. We've seen Max Scherzer is there negotiating on behalf of the players to try to see if they can get any wiggle room here. So um, that's my what to watch for to see if there's any updates coming forward on those negotiations. Jason, I have a source that you're going to give us some hockey news. The NHL, we should give a quick shout out to our job board, Matt Haig, found a job posting for the NHL as an associate counsel. Check that out on our job board. Taryn does a great job filtering that out with our, our newsletter. And also the Nashville Predators, who I have now learned their nickname is Smashville. They have a legal intern posting. So we post jobs of all shapes and sizes, lawyers, law students, that fun stuff. But Jason, let me let me kick it over to you. What's the latest in, in hockey? Monday, March 21st is arguably my favorite day of the year annually. And that is the NHL trade deadline, whatever day that may fall on uh, each year. And my New York Rangers are buyers this year. So you know, there's something to be said for when your team is a seller and you're moving some of your stars. It's, it's a little bit, you know, it hurts. You grow up with those stars and, and you love them, but it's also fun to acquire prospects, picks, whatever it may be. So this year, the Rangers are buyers. And I'm going to make some quick predictions here for some of the notable names that are on the market, where I think they're going to end up. So in a month, we're going to replay this and I'm going to go like five for five. So here we go. Claude Giroux is going to play his thousandth game in Philadelphia. They're not going to move him until he does that. But when they do, the bustling Colorado Avalanche are going to come through and they're going to trade maybe Bowen Byram and a first rounder for Claude Giroux going to Colorado. we got John Klingberg is not agreeing with Dallas on a new contract. Miro Heiskanen is taking up a lot of the cap space there on the defensive end. John Klingberg, welcome to Toronto. You're now a Maple Leaf. Moving along, we got Tomas Hurdle in San Jose. They have uh, rumored to be in extension talks. I don't think it'll go productively. I think Minnesota comes in, maybe dangles Marco Rossi or a couple other prospects, and he goes and becomes a member of the Wild. And finally, my Rangers, we're going to go big. I'm going to get Ben Chirot to New York for a first-round pick and give me uh, either Joe Pavelski or, or Phil Kessel because we need a top-six winger desperately. The game last night was really, really painful to watch against Vancouver. So the Rangers bring in Joe Pavelski or Phil Kessel, who, by the way, are both American superstars. So, Jason, we will we will hold you to those predictions. Mine is going to be uh, fairly quick. I've been having a lot of fun following the different drama on the Nets. You know, now we have two kind of sports law stories circling. So the story that we did not hit on the, on the podcast really at length was the James Harden for Ben Simmons trade. Ben Simmons, I don't know if he's hurt. I don't know if it's a mental health issue. I know the guy has not been playing for a couple months. And now all of a sudden he's saying, oh, he's got a re-aggravated a back issue. He, he has no timetable for return. The running joke online is that, well, he's magically going to get uh, healthy on March 11th. That's the day after the Nets return to Philadelphia in the hostile territory. So, you know, it's kind of his sports law commentary. You know, I don't know if he does come back on March 11th, the day after he was supposed to return to hospital, you know, hostile Philadelphia. It sounds like a fabricated injury, right? And there was a whole argument about whether he was mentally healthy to play and whatnot. We're not here to comment on someone's mental health or, you know, what, whatnot. But, you know, this a lot of this, you could read it as being a lot of, say, chess playing and a lot of maybe manipulation of injury reports and doctor's reports. You know, I, 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 the whole Ben Simmons situation has kind of rubbed me the wrong way. So, you know, I guess that's one story with the Nets. And the other one, Kyrie Irving, is only right now playing away games because of New York City's vaccine mandate. It's very strange. If you're an unvaccinated road player, you can actually play at the Barclays Center. It doesn't make any sense. And if you are an unvaccinated home player, you can't. So unclear why that would be the case. They are changing the vax mandate as of March 7th. At least Woj and Shams had these reporting. That's not actually going to allow Kyrie to return to play games at Barclays because that's a, a private sector change. So we'll see. At some point, I think the, the sourcing is before the playoff start, Kyrie will be able to return. But if you're 
a better here and you're trying to figure out who to bet right now, the nets, right. They might not have Kyrie. If the game is like at home, I'm putting it in quotes at home, Kyrie can't play in game seven. Like that's bizarre. So this is one of these weird ones, just like we had with tennis. You got to be paying attention to the laws in order to see how to properly bet on this for sports. So we have a story coming out. It should be up by the time you listen to it by Maxwell Popkin. One of my top students in my New York law school class came to me with this topic. And let's just say uh, our, our friends in the betting world are very interested in our analysis. Of this. So we'll have that one out. Mike, you're, you're making a face like, like you have something that we're missing. Just one more, just because it just happened today. And I'm a big Yankees fan. So obviously this jumps out at me. But Derek Jeter is stepping down as the CEO of the Miami Marlins. And he's also relinquishing his ownership stake, which is about 4%, with the Marlins. Now, He cites that the vision for the future of this franchise is different than when he signed up to lead the team. That's what he cited to. Who knows if this has anything to do with the current, you know, like I just said with Mike, what to watch for the current, you know, labor negotiations that we have with the new CBA. He obviously is a first ballot Hall of Famer, longtime player. So maybe he has more allegiance with the players than what the owners are pushing for in this the CBA negotiations here. So who knows? Uh, exactly what the reason is. There's definitely more to come on this. Obviously, you know, a lot of people are going to say, you know, he was here for four or five years. He came in, he traded John Carlos Stanton to the Yankees. Does he have some sort of like, what would you call that, Dan? What, what would you put the uh, the crime at? I'd say espionage, right? You came in as an agent of the Yankees. And then all of a sudden, <laughs> where, where did John Carlos Stanton go? I mean, I, I mean, you're not you're not wrong if you think that Derek Jeter always had his alliances to the Yankees because he came into the Marlins on day one. He's like, okay, time for a big trade. Who should we trade him with? There was a trade to trade Stanton to my Giants that was nixed, I guess, internally or someone nixed. Maybe Stanton did, but I don't know. Proof uh, you trade your top asset to the Yankees. Well, I mean, that's- and the Marlins lost Yelich. They lost D. Gordon. They, their whole team kind of crumbled as well uh, through this through this. If you If you were like years. a secret agent, trying to help the Yankees out. Like that's kind of what you do. You try to make it not so obvious. You send Yelich out, you send, yeah, you know, yeah. D Gordon, to, but you send the main piece Stanton the Yankees, but had that worked out? How many titles have you won with Stanton? But the, but the Marlins also yeah, said that wait, they were always trying to the, cut. The answer, the answer Mike is zero, but keep going. <laughs> they were, they were the trying Marlins to cut always do that, though. They always do that for the last decade. You know, they ship out Miguel Cabrera, whoever it may be. I don't, I don't know right. if you blame Jeter. Stop, stop defending know. Jeter. Right. Stop defending Jeter. It could he's be, a, it could be on the, you know, Jeter was getting paid $5 million as the CEO, right? They might be cutting his salary now. Oh, a little kickback scheme, Mike. I see what you're doing here. We'll investigate. Ooh. We're on it. Okay, so that'll put us in the books. Uh, I know if Wallach was here, you want me to plug March 4th. Dan and I are both speaking at the New York Law School Sports Law Colloquium. And that's uh, a lot of names that our, our listeners will be familiar with. I'm on a panel with Darren Heitner and Michael McCann. Dan is on a sports betting panel with Mark Edelman. And of all names, this one was fun. One of the panels is being moderated by Stan Van Gundy, former NBA coach. I think most recently he was with ESPN. He did some, he was with the Pelicans with uh, Zion. Maybe we'll cover Zion and his, we'll say his incident, his brewing battle with the Pelicans. We'll cover that at some point here. Okay, that's March 4th. We have the link to sign up on our LinkedIn, all of our fun stuff. I am at Sports Law Lust. Dan Wallach's at Wallach Legal. Mike is at Mike underscore son of underscore law. Jason, he is now Jason underscore more. For everyone here, our kind of detrimental family, kind of detrimental.com, the new show, opening arguments. If you want to join our team, as always, just email us, condetrimental at gmail.com. For all of us here, we will see you next time on another episode of Conduct Detrimental.